Oh, welcome back to our next session um, on the Citizen Convention on Climate in France. We will start in a few minutes. Um, my colleague Anne will moderate the workshop. She will give you some infos. We will start now with a 20 minute video about the convention. But yeah, I give the word now to Anne so she can explain a bit more what you can expect now. So Anne. Yes, hello. Also a warm welcome from uh, my side to everyone. Um, yes, <laughs> we've had a little change of plans. We were supposed to have Nadine, Nadine Brenner, one of the citizens from the, um, yeah, from the Citizens Convention in France, but she had to cancel due to an emergency. It seems to be a thing today. Um, instead, uh, we have a very nice um, alternative, or actually two, so Thorsten Stärk from Mehr Demokratie and the Bürgerrats or Citizens Assembly um, on Democracy uh, is joining us today. Um, hi Thorsten, thank you. <laughs> and also Achim Wölfe from Mehr Demokratie. No, he <laughs> will join us later. So um, before we start the video, very shortly on the rules of conduct. Um, maybe you've heard it in other sessions already, so we do not tolerate hate speech or spam. And um, the chat is to be used only or mainly for topics relevant to the sessions. If you want to engage after the video, um, yeah, I can also repeat it again later, please write a question in the chat or raise your hand. Um, you can do this if you click on participants and then you should see a little hand button at the bottom. Okay, <laughs> let's get started. Okay, maybe shortly about the video. So it's a pre-recorded video with uh, Nadine Brenner. So the citizen uh, from the Citizens Convention, it is in French, but with subtitles. Donc, euh, bienvenue au Forum Mondial sur la démocratie directe contemporaine. À travers l'Europe, les individus débattent des enjeux de protection climatique, de nouveaux concepts plus durables de transport et de la protection des espèces et des plantes. Par la démocratie directe et les conseils citoyens, les citoyens mettent euh, ces concepts en avant. Pour le Forum mondial sur la démocratie directe contemporaine, nous avons réuni les exemples les plus impressionnants des pays européens, avec lesquels nous souhaitons montrer que plus de pouvoir au peuple est un pas dans la bonne direction, et que ce débat important ne peut être seulement traité par le Parlement. Donc aujourd'hui, nous avons comme invité euh, Nadine Brunner, qui euh, a participé à la Convention citoyenne euh, sur le climat en France, et euh, qui va nous en dire un peu plus, donc euh, je vous laisse vous présenter. Bonjour à tous et à toutes, je suis Nadine Brunner, je viens de France, comme ça a été déjà dit avant. J'habite dans la région d'Alsace, donc j'ai déjà un petit, juste à la frontière allemande et suisse, donc dans les trois frontières, au niveau des trois frontières. Effectivement, j'ai été tirée au sort pour la Convention citoyenne pour le climat, qui a été une expérience assez formidable, très intéressante aussi, j'ai appris énormément de choses. Et voilà, maintenant je suis avec vous pour en parler et puis vous faire vous partager mon, mon expérience. Ou ouais. mon aventure plutôt, c'est plutôt une aventure qu'une expérience. Voilà. Je, vous remercie, je vous remercie de vous joindre à nous. Donc euh, d'abord, je vais parler de avant votre participation au Conseil des citoyens. Est-ce que vous étiez déjà euh, impliqué dans la vie politique Alors impliqué, non. Intéressé, oui. Euh, disons que je suis, de, je suis apolitique, je ne suis ni de gauche ni de droite, ça ne m'intéresse pas. Euh, je, je fais moyennement confiance aux, aux zones politiques, bien que maintenant, euh, suite à la convention, ben, on va voir ce que ça donne. Euh, <coughs> par contre, j'ai une, une grande confiance dans, dans, dans les citoyens. Euh, donc, au niveau politique, non, impliqué, non. Intéressé, oui. Suivre la politique, suivre ce qui se passe, oui. Mais vous n'êtes pas avant. Non, non, non. À politique. D'accord. Et du coup, peut-être que vous pouvez nous parler un peu de comment vous avez été choisi pour la première fois 
Et euh, comment ça s'est passé euh, de votre côté Alors, j'ai été choisie par euh, tirage au sort, c'est-à-dire qu'un jour, je vais vous raconter une petite histoire, hein, j'ai été contactée par téléphone et on m'a parlé de... Euh, on m'a demandé si j'étais intéressée par le, le changement climatique et si j'avais envie de, de participer à, à une convention qui traiterait de ce, ce sujet. Euh, j'ai d'abord cru que c'était une plaisanterie, <rire> sûr, beaucoup d'appels téléphoniques, donc on se demande si c'est toujours une plaisanterie. Euh, mais quelque chose, euh, j'ai accepté. En fait, j'ai accepté, j'ai dit oui, tout de même. Et jusqu'à ce que je reçoive le billet de train dans la boîte aux lettres, je pensais que c'était une blague. Donc, euh, <rire> voilà, j'ai vu mon billet de train, je me dis tiens, c'est sérieux. Oui, ok, donc je suis allée à Paris. Euh, avec ma petite valise pour euh, participer à cette convention citoyenne pour le climat. Voilà. Donc vous étiez euh, 150 citoyens euh, tirés au sort, il me semble Voilà, nous avons été effectivement 150 citoyens tirés au sort. Et il a été fait en sorte que nous soyons toujours 150. D'accord. C'est-à-dire que s'il y avait des absents lors de ces différentes sessions, on a toujours essayé, il a toujours essayé, on a toujours essayé de faire en sorte que, excusez-moi du bafouillage, que euh, nous soyons au complet. Voilà. Et euh, au niveau de la représentation, est-ce que vous pensez que le tirage au sort était une bonne manière je, je, je pense euh, oui, d'une certaine façon oui, parce qu'en fait euh, c'est anonyme, donc on ne sait pas qui on appelle, on ne sait pas qui on a en face de soi, on pose des questions, on nous a posé des questions sur notre âge, sur euh, notre travail, ce que nous faisions dans la vie, euh, hommes, femmes bien sûr, pour avoir un équilibre, euh, donc en fait non, ça c'est, euh, je pense que c'est une bonne méthode, c'est, euh, voilà. Parce que c'est vraiment pas visuel, donc c'est un contact uniquement par téléphone, on ne sait pas qui on a en face, donc c'est simplement par réponse à des questions qu'on va faire ce tri, et ce, enfin ce tri, ce choix de, de ok, est-ce que ça vous intéresse Oui, ça m'intéresse, non, ça ne m'intéresse pas. Donc là, moi je pense que c'est une bonne méthode, oui. D'accord. Et... J'ai en plus, donc c'est pas mal. <rire> et du coup, par rapport au Conseil des citoyens même, qui a duré, il me semble, entre 8 et 9 mois euh, neuf mois, neuf mois. <rire> pour être exact puisqu'on a eu quelques petits soucis techniques entre temps euh, donc euh, ça devait durer quatre mois au départ effectivement on a eu euh, comme vous le savez au mois de décembre des grèves qui nous ont reporté qui nous ont décalé plus euh, malheureusement le corona euh, le covid 19 qui a fait euh, qui nous a encore décalé aussi ça ne nous a pas empêché de travailler entre temps, mais c'est vrai que là, ça a duré euh, pratiquement neuf mois. Oui. Et comment le conseil s'est or organisé De quelle manière vous avez procédé euh... Alors, ça s'est passé par, euh, de différentes façons. De, de première façon, c'était du présentiel, c'est-à-dire que euh, euh, nous avons assisté à, en, sur des week-ends, nous avons fait des différentes sessions. D'accord Donc, il y en a eu sept au total, sept bis, sept et demi, on va dire. Euh, la première session s'est passée euh, début octobre où on a eu euh, des informations, on nous a donné les informations, on a tous eu la même information par rapport au climat, par rapport au, à l'urgence, par rapport à ce, à ce, au fait qu'il fallait agir vite. Donc, en fait, c'est nous qui avons décidé effectivement qu'il fallait agir vite parce qu'on nous a donné toutes ces informations. Donc, au niveau scientifique, au niveau économique, etc. Donc, on a vraiment eu un, un je veux dire, le, la première journée, ça a été. Euh, en fait, on a eu une, une claque parce qu'on ne s'attendait pas à ce que ce soit aussi grave. Donc, c'est à partir de là que tout a démarré et que, en fait, notre travail a vraiment commencé. Donc, après, par mois, on, une fois par mois, à peu près, nous avions une séance, euh, enfin une session, sur, euh, toujours sur un week-end, vendredi, samedi, dimanche, où nous étions tous euh, ensemble, les 150 et où, euh, effectivement, euh, nous avons travaillé par différents groupes. Donc, ces groupes euh, de travail, euh, donc il y en a eu cinq, étaient tirés au sort. C'est-à-dire que nous avons tiré au sort, dans, sorti un petit papier dans un sac, « Ok, tu es dans ce groupe, ok, tu es dans ce groupe. » On ne savait pas à l'avance où nous allions, dans, dans, dans quel groupe de travail nous allions rentrer. 
je trouve ça, on est resté sur le, le, le principe du tirage au sort démocratique jusqu'au bout. Donc personne ne décide, ok, je vais quelque part parce que ça me plaît. Non, je vais, j'ai tiré au sort, je vais dans ce groupe et je cherche mes informations, je travaille sur ce, les différents thèmes que j'ai envie de que je découvre, que je, 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 je développe et je, je, avec les 30 autres, 30 autres personnes qui étaient avec moi dans ce groupe. Par exemple, moi, j'étais dans Produire et Travailler. Et nous avons réparti, nous nous sommes répartis les tâches et nous avons échangé, débattu, euh, fait des recherches et euh, développé les, les mesures que nous voulions amener euh, à, être, à être votées, à être travaillées par euh, no, notre Assemblée nationale, euh, nos députés et notre président. Du coup, au niveau de l'organisation, vous étiez plutôt libre de choisir comment vous souhaitiez procéder en session c'est vous qui avez décidé euh, Oui et non. Disons que on nous a proposé une trame de travail. Si elle ne nous convenait pas, on le disait. Non, non on ne veut pas travailler comme ça. On, essayait, on a toujours essayé de débattre et de, de, de faire évoluer les choses proprement. Enfin, C'est-à-dire de, de toujours vraiment en discuter. C'est-à-dire au niveau démocratique, que chacun ait, euh, puisse dire ce qu'il pense et dire voilà moi ça me convient pas bon bien sûr s'il y a une personne ça lui convient pas les autres ça convient on va toujours à la majorité c'est normal c'est le principe démocratique d'accord et du coup à propos des différents thèmes au sein des différentes sessions est-ce qu'il y a eu beaucoup de différents de sujets qui étaient un peu conflictuels alors conflictuels non, pas bon dans les groupes, pas vraiment. C'est-à-dire qu'on a, on a beaucoup, bon, ch chacun a sa façon de voir la, les choses. Je veux dire, nous sommes, nous étions des, nous sommes des personnes qui ont été tirées au sort de différents horizons, de différents niveaux sociaux, de différentes cultures, de différents euh, chômeurs, travailleurs, chefs d'entreprise, médecins, chirurgiens, etc. Nous avions un petit peu, vraiment, un panel représentatif de. Du, de la population française. Donc, effectivement, chacun aborde et voit les choses différemment. Donc, euh, les idées que nous, qui étaient amenées par les uns et, et les autres étaient discutées, débattues, et on arrivait à un consensus, et on continuait sur ce consensus. Donc, effectivement, il y a eu des discussions assez euh, intenses euh, <coughs> par groupe. Ensuite, euh, à la fin, la dernière session où ont lieu les votes des... 150 mesures, bon maintenant il y en a plus que 149, des 149 mesures, pardon. Euh, chacun, chaque groupe a présenté les mesures qu'il voulait amener et ce sont les 150 qui ont voté si oui ou non on les gardait ou pas. Oui. Donc je veux dire, ça a vraiment été un travail de, de, de tous. Effectivement, il y a eu des, des débats très intenses. Il y a une, euh, comment dire, une mesure qui a été rejetée raison x, y, mais je crois que c'est visible sur le site de la convention, donc on peut voir pourquoi. Si ça, vous pouvez, en fait, on peut le suivre, donc il n'y a pas de souci, et rien n'est caché. Et euh, les débats, il y en a eu, oui, il y a eu beaucoup de débats, <rire> sur beaucoup de points en fait, sur, sur énormément de points. Mais on est tous à, toujours arrivés à discuter et à, mettre, à faire ce consensus qui a permis de faire avancer les choses et de choisir, ok, de dire cette mesure on la garde, cette mesure on la garde pas. D'accord. Ouais. Et est-ce que vous pouvez nous en dire un peu plus peut-être sur euh, quel sujet était peut-être que certains sujets étaient plus controversés ou certains thèmes plus controversés que d'autres et d'autres qui faisaient plus l'objet d'un consensus Alors, euh, le thème le plus controversé, celui qui a été rejeté et qui est visible sur Internet, c'est donc les fameux 28 heures oui. par semaine, de travail par semaine. Donc ce sujet-là, ça a été rejeté, ça a été euh, voté, euh, il a été voté non. Euh, lors de la dernière session. Cette, cette mesure n'a pas été retenue. Euh, en fait, euh, que dire C'est un sujet, je crois, qui est un petit peu en avance. Euh, en fait, ce que nous voulions amener, parce que c'est mon groupe qui a présenté cette mesure, euh, nous voulions simplement amener une réflexion sur ce thème, et je crois que ça a été un petit peu mal compris. Donc... Euh, Peut-être un peu tôt aussi, ou peut-être... Euh, voilà. Il <rire> faut voir. Mais apparemment, maintenant, c'est un sujet qui revient à la mode, donc <rire> je ne sais pas. Il faut... <rire> faut étudier. <rire> en fait, c'est simplement une étude qu'on voulait lancer, sachant très bien que ce n'était pas possible tout de suite. Ouais. Il faut, faut étudier la chose, c'est tout. Ouais. 
C'est ce que nous demandions, et puis euh, je pense que ça a été mal perçu, mal compris, en fait. Ouais. Et est-ce que vous êtes plutôt satisfaite du résultat global obtenu de, de, de la convention en elle-même euh, Oui et non. Oui, parce qu'on est arrivé tous ensemble, à 150, à trouver un... À, à voter des mesures et des propositions, euh, voire même qui vont être portées peut-être, j'espère, au niveau européen. Ça, ça ne dépendra pas de nous. Euh, oui, parce que là, on a vraiment fait un travail énorme. On a prouvé que les citoyens, à partir du moment où ils avaient les bonnes informations, la même information, on pouvait, ils étaient capables, les citoyens étaient capables de prendre, de faire des choix d'amener des propositions euh, censées, je veux dire, de, de, du, du point de vue du citoyen. Donc moi, ça, moi je, je trouve que c'est un travail démocratique parfait, quoi. Enfin, parfait, rien n'est jamais parfait, bien sûr, mais quelque chose de très bien et, et, et qu'il faudrait développer, qu'il faut développer. Je sais que beaucoup de régions chez nous le font déjà, je ne sais pas comment ça se passe en Allemagne ou... Ou dans les autres pays, là, malheureusement, je n'ai pas trop, trop d'informations là-dessus. Je n'ai pas encore eu le temps, je vous dirais, je suis toujours sur mes mesures. Donc, euh, mais c est, c est, le, le citoyen peut, à partir du moment où on lui donne la bonne information, et que tout c'est la même information surtout, pas une information comme ça, un petit bout là, un petit bout là. Euh, je pense qu'il y a des choses qui sont euh, à travailler là-dessus, en fait, à développer. Est-ce qu'il y aurait quelque chose que vous auriez fait différemment euh, Au niveau de, de quoi euh, bah, Du coup, pas forcément au niveau de la convention, euh, pas forcément au niveau du conseil, parce que vous avez l'air de dire que ça s'est plutôt bien passé, mais plutôt au niveau de la convention même. Euh, la convention en elle-même, euh, non. Moi, c'est surtout après la convention nous a, où, où, où j'attends... Je suis un petit peu sur, dans l'attente, en fait, parce que j'aimerais vraiment que, euh, que les informations que nous avons eues soient euh, communiquées à tous. Ouais. Donc, je veux dire que, que pas seulement 150 citoyens, moi, j'aimerais que, que tous euh, soient au même niveau. Quoi. Je veux dire qu'on ait tous le même niveau de connaissance et de, de, de partage d'informations. Ouais. C'est ce, qui me, ce qui, me, qui met un petit peu dans, dans l'attente, en fait. Il ouais. faut voir après. C'est avec le temps que ça va se, se, se développer. Et du coup, euh, quel regard vous portez maintenant sur votre expérience au Conseil des citoyens Est-ce que ça vous a incité à rester impliqué dans la vie politique Ouais, là je suis... Euh, vie politique, à proprement parler telle qu'elle est actuellement, non mais effectivement, au niveau des citoyens, oui, j'essaie de m'engager plus, c'est-à-dire de partager beaucoup plus euh, ce que j'ai vécu. Et, et comme dit, dans, dans, dans la région, région Alsace, il y a beaucoup de, de conseils citoyens, on va dire, de, 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 de citoyens, de, de, de comités citoyens participatifs, enfin, ça, ça dépend comment on l'appelle, il y a différents noms, mais cette démocratie participative, j'aimerais bien... Euh, ouais, la, 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 la développer ouais. plus et la faire connaître plus. Enfin, développer, les gens ils pensent déjà, c'est déjà en place, mais surtout la, la, la partager et la faire avancer. Mmh. C'était les gens à participer. Voilà. Merci. <rire> et euh, du coup, quelle est maintenant la prochaine étape Parce que la convention a été rédigée. Euh, quelle est la prochaine étape pour les résultats alors, là, nous avons créé une association qui a pour but de suivre les mesures et qui a, comme l'a dit le président de la République, un droit d'alerte. C'est-à-dire qu'à partir du moment où nous verrons que euh, bah, ça ne va pas dans le sens où nous voulions, nous tirerons la sonnette d'alarme. Euh, là, comment ça se passe actuellement là, Les vacances sont finies, août est passé, donc maintenant, là, là, ça va reprendre. Ça reprend déjà, d'ailleurs. Et nous allons voir des, des groupes de travail, des sessions de travail avec les députés, les sénateurs, avec les politiques, avec les citoyens, avec beaucoup de, de, de groupes de, de travail pour justement présenter. Excusez-moi. J'ai pas. 
Oui, oui, laissez tomber. <rire> Présenter euh, nos mesures et nos propositions et les défendre. D'accord. Et du coup, avec euh, le coronavirus, vous avez été retardé ou est-ce que ça pose encore problème ben, Effectivement, on a été retardé et puis ça a un peu changé la donne en fait. Euh, les choses ont, sont. On a une vision différente maintenant du monde depuis le coronavirus. Donc effectivement, euh, ça s'accélère. Pour moi, ça s'accélère. Maintenant, ça n'engage que moi. Je, je trouve que le processus doit s'accélérer un petit peu. Quoi. Je veux dire, il faut mettre la deuxième vitesse maintenant. D'accord. Et j'ai vu sur le site qu'il y avait une possibilité, après pour la convention, qu'elle soit soit proposée au Parlement par un vote, soit par un référendum. Est-ce que vous avez d'informations à ce sujet sur vers quelle direction Alors effectivement, nous allons, nous voulons travailler sur, nous avons fait une proposition de référendum sur différents thèmes. C'est un sujet qui va être travaillé, qui va être étudié surtout d'abord, parce qu'un référendum, ça se fait pas comme ça. Donc là, c'est une, une option qui, enfin c'est pas une option, c'est c'est quelque chose que nous suivons de près et que nous voulons lancer. Quoi. Oui. Donc, selon la Constitution française, on ne peut pas faire ça comme on veut. Hein. Il faut, faut suivre certaines règles. Voilà. Et également, euh, nous avons proposé également des changements au niveau de la Constitution, <coughs> Donc, notamment au niveau de l'écocide, que nous voudrions bien intégrer dans notre Constitution et qui permettrait de poser un cadre de protection pour notre environnement et la biodiversité, enfin sur, sur notre, notre planète. Ouais. Protection de notre planète, voilà. D'accord. Est-ce euh, que vous voulez rajouter quelque chose euh, Non, je si, oui, je vais... c'est une expérience qui, est... qui a été intense, qui a pris euh, 200% de notre temps, je crois qu'on a surpris beaucoup de, de monde. Je crois qu'autour de nous, enfin tout, en tout cas les organisateurs ne s'attendaient pas à ce que les citoyens s'investissent autant dans cette convention. Il euh, faut savoir qu'entre les différentes sessions présentielles, euh, on a travaillé énormément en vidéoconférence entre nous, avec des scientifiques, avec des, des économistes, avec, on a cherché énormément d'informations et je crois qu'on a surpris énormément de monde lorsque euh, bah, tout le monde s'est rendu compte qu'en fait, on cherchait, on voulait améliorer, les euh, chercher des solutions, on voulait proposer quelque chose de, 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 de bien cadré, de bien net et propre. Je ne sais pas si je suis claire. Hein. <rire> <rire> c'est ça, je comprends bien. Euh, du coup, j'ai fini toutes mes questions. Je vous remercie euh, d'avoir répondu et euh, d'avoir euh, participé. Euh. Eh ben, je, je vous remercie beaucoup. J'espère que j'ai pu répondre à beaucoup de questions, enfin apporter des réponses euh, adéquates. Maintenant, euh, je reste à disposition si vous avez besoin encore de, 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 de réponses ou d'informations. Il n'y a pas de problème. Euh, je partage volontiers tout ce que, tout ce que je peux partager. <rire> Merci. Je vous remercie. So, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> after this interview and first of all a big thank you to uh, Hannah Dorigny who uh, yeah, was one of our former interns um, obviously speaks French and agreed to record this for us um, a quick update on who is joining us for this session um, so as I mentioned Thorsten Stärk who um, is involved in the Bürgerrat Demokratie and also constantly doing research on citizens' conventions around the world. And um, we are also joined by Percy Fogel, who followed the French convention very, very closely and also visited it for a briefing tour where he got to meet the participants and he can tell us something about the, the atmosphere uh, at the convention and provide some insights. So, um, Are there any questions already? I saw the first question was already answered 
in the chat. Hm? Um, hm? So um, Daniel Chili asked if President President Macron um, didn't promise to hold referendums on the results. And Caroline van Nijen already said that this was up to the citizens of the convention to decide. Um, and they only chose to do this on three questions out of 150. So only three questions were submitted to a referendum. Yes. Um, if there are no questions at the beginning, I would give the floor to Percy Vogel. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the briefing tour and um, yeah, how was the how was the convention from the inside? Yeah, uh, I must say that uh, when we went there, it was uh, the Corona um, pandemic was just uh, starting, so uh, we were not exactly mingling with uh, participants. Uh, we were asked to uh, keep um, keep a distance. And so it was not really as much an inside view as we would like have liked to have. Um, but what uh, so what we just heard from uh, Nadine was um, is uh, still valuable uh, to me or everybody who studies that to get these inside um, views. Um, the during the trip we uh, met several uh, people's the um, steering committee, so to say. Um, uh, some of the scientists who advised the whole process um, and so on was more um, uh, the, the people, of course, organized the whole thing. Mise en public uh, was in the center. And um, yeah, um, so I, I think I can give so much uh, uh, the uh, in really inside um, mood picture from from obs um, well, from an onlooker, we were in the uh, plenary uh, session uh, watching from an uh, upper level. Um, I mean, can just uh, confirm what Nadine said from outside. It was an impressive, uh, Im impressive institution uh, to see that um, live, the uh, professionalism and, and the dedication of the participants. Um, and if I, now, looking back uh, from the whole process, what I, I think is really remarkable uh, in an international perspective is really the the size of the whole thing. With the it, it uh, was planned to uh, be um, uh, six sessions and turned out to be nine, um, and uh, with long weekends. And I think, does anybody know whether anything like that has happened anywhere else with uh, on just one on just one topic? Uh, so that was very courageous, and of course uh, uh, t tells us uh, how far we can go to push uh, citizen assemblies to their limits. Um, there were some complaints that it's too long, but on the other hand, they did have a, a really huge task, uh, which they were only able to tackle with this uh, trick of subdividing the 150 people into subgroups. And that seems to have worked also really well um, and, and gives another instrument to citizen assemblies to tackle really complex problems where different sectors, in this case was truly sectors of, of, um, that are relevant to the climate, uh, can be handled with uh, separately, but still uh, be uh, treated together in the end. Um, and another aspect that was special to the whole process is that uh, they had these lawyers um, uh, in the end and, and brought their suggestions uh, very close to um, yeah, law language and, and um, legal text uh, because they the citizens could also decide uh, whether uh, their suggestions uh, should go to parliament or to referendum and so on. And that took a lot of time and effort too, but um, I can't say it whether it was worth, worth the effort, but that was also an interesting aspect of the whole thing that I don't see where that has anything, uh, anything we can compare it to, um, at least at the national level uh, in the world. 
And what is interesting, what was not, um, could not be anticipated is that the citizens formed this group of the 150 that is still there formed an uh, NGO and is lobbying for uh, the results of the whole thing. Um, that would be also interesting to, to discuss uh, in how far that is a good thing or not. <laughs> Who should, uh, should the same citizens be uh, uh, advocating uh, their results or not? Is that something, uh, a, a model for other countries? I find that very interesting. Um, and my expectation is that it will be valuable in, in, in the end uh, as we observe in how far the measures suggested are being taken seriously by the politicians. Yeah, so much for now. From my side, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know, Torsten, if you already want to say something about the French convention, also from, um, yeah, from your point of view, organizing a citizens convention in Germany, maybe that um, would be nice to compare a little or, yeah. Yeah, um, I also can say, as uh, Percy said, uh, that it was a very ambitious uh, citizens assembly with uh, a lot of work there that was done by the 150 uh, which uh, were chosen to take part in it, and uh, well, it seems from 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 the far far from far away that uh, they were very professional. All were um, not knowing but much about climate change and uh, first threatened uh, on, on what I heard from the experts, uh, but then became um, yeah kind of activists uh, to um, find solutions. Uh, they uh, recommended at the at the end with 149 uh, recommendations, um, and uh, what's uh, striking too is uh, the, the president and the government um, stood behind this uh, assembly, and uh, very clear said that they uh, want to uh, deal with the results and to to put them into law mostly. There are now three or four um, recommendations um, which. Uh, Will maybe not be taken um, in, into a law. Um, for example, uh, the speed uh, speed limit, uh, which didn't have a, a wide majority um, in the um, convention in the um, citizens assembly itself. Uh, and uh, President Macron said that he uh, takes three jokers on, on topics he, he didn't like. The other one was a tax on uh, dividend and dividends, is it right? Um, and uh, the foreword of, of the constitution, um, which uh, was not clear if, if it is uh, uh, makeable to, to, to change it as, as a convention, the citizen assembly uh, wanted to do it. But now they, they are in, in a process and, um, and, and many uh, talks with, with uh, ministries, with uh, NGOs, with uh, business leaders, uh, which is also, I think, exceptional um, because there isn't uh, such uh, a big engagement uh, of members in other citizens' assemblies. Uh, they, they founded uh, Lea, um, uh, an organization uh, to, to um, uh, stay together and uh, work on, on, um, on the recommendations to, to put them into law. And um, these are all um, signs of, of hope, I would say. Sorry for my English at the moment. Thank you again for joining us <laughs> without any time for preparation. Um, yeah, Caroline Vernein, you also wanted to add something to the um, yeah, to the follow-up after the convention. Yeah, because um, Daniel asked his question in the chat about the referendum. Um, I just uh, wanted to add something to that um, because here at Democracy International, we were of course also very interested in the whole process and we followed it closely. Um, we also supported the convention uh, with translations and, and things like this. Um, and so first of I just want to un help underline um, what, what Torsten and Percy have said, like the, the 
outset from this convention was really already um, amazing. The government basically committed to reducing greenhouse gases, uh, greenhouse gas emissions to 40% just going into the convention um, and then citizens um, were able to decide how this was going to happen. Um, and Macron has also said from the beginning um, that the citizens convention themselves would get to decide um, what happens now with the proposals that they make. So they came up with 150 proposals and for all for each of these proposal, they were able to say if they wanted this to be implemented directly to be put to the parliament or to be put to a referendum. Um, and so this is, of course, um, something that was um, that was very interesting um, and um, so what happened is that in the end, the citizens of the convention decided to put three questions out of 149 uh, proposals that they made um, to a referendum. Um, Nadine already mentioned that two of them are changes to the constitution. Um, it's about, um, I believe the, the preamble of the constitution says uh, to respect um, human rights uh, and so on. It, it would be to add respect for the environment um, to the constitution. And one is um, to add the crime of ecocide um, to the to the criminal code um, to make so to make it something that's punishable by law. Um, these um, these questions will be put to a referendum. Um, as she said, of course, it's a complicated system, especially in a country that does not have a lot of referendums. Uh, it will take a while before a vote on this um, is possible. Um, but I also wanted to add something else about the acceptance in, um, in society at large in France. Um, so there has actually been some, some research um, on what French citizens uh, think of the, of the work of the convention and of this referendum question. Um, and so what we see is that 60% of all French citizens, according to this, to this research, which, is, um, which was done by, by very good um, some very reliable research uh, organizations. Um, uh, um, so 60% of French citizens had heard of the work of the convention and of those 60%, um, another 60% were generally in favor of what the convention has proposed. So this is really a very big rate of acceptance um, in French society at large. Um, they also asked about a couple of specific measures that um, that have been proposed and I, I will just read them if you don't mind, uh, that way I'm sure I'm correct. Um, so the first one is uh, integrating the preservation of the environment in the constitution. So this is one of the questions that will be, uh, that will go to a referendum and 82% of French citizens um, agrees with this. Um, one of them is um, making energy efficient renovation of private buildings obligatory. Um, this is something that Macron had proposed to send to a referendum while the convention was ongoing, which was a little bit strange because, of course, um, this was something he had said that the citizens were allowed to decide um, and uh, that they've decided finally that will not be voted on in a referendum. Um, but still, research shows that 74% of citizens agree with this. Um, the introduction of the crime of ecocide in the criminal code, um, only 52% of French citizens agree with this, and this is something that will go to a referendum, and so that seems uh, to, uh, to end up in a very exciting referendum. Um, and then there is one, uh, one measure, uh, Thorsen has already mentioned that uh, Macron has put his personal veto on this as well. Um, it is lowering the speed limit on highways to 110 kilometers per hour. Uh, so citizen, only 26% of French people agree with this measure. Uh, Macron himself does not agree with it. And actually even the citizens in the convention, um, for, for them, this was the lowest, uh, the lowest rated uh, proposal that they made um, but with 60% of, um, of uh, convention members even just being in favor of this. Um, but what, um, what does find large approval in French society is that, um, that all of the work of the convention gets put to a referendum. Uh, this was also a question that was asked uh, by this research, um, and it shows that 81% of French citizens would actually like to vote on the work of the convention, um, which shows that there is, there's actually a much larger, um, a much larger debate to be had on um, how to involve citizens now in the follow-up um, of, the, of the work of the convention. Thank you, Paula. Um, a quest, if, are there any questions, first of all, from our audience? Yes, there is a question. 
Yes, I would have a question to yeah, Torsten and Percy. Um, what I find interesting also when we heard, heard now from Caroline the the results or the acceptance rate inside of the of the um, of the city of the of the participants of the convention. I mean, usually we think that there's a big divide between uh, these different uh, between citizens about climate change. We heard that all the time. The media's media discussions really large. What do you, or can you explain from your experience what happens there during this deliberation in the in the in such a convention? Why why this? Um... Caroline. Sorry, just to make this clear, this was not the citizens of the convention, but all citizens of France. Okay, so maybe I did understand it wrong. It's, it's just, it, for me also, but still surprising that they have such a um, large uh, uh, um, acceptance in inside the, the climate convention about their proposals. I mean, for me, from the from the sort of society's perspective, in Germany, I think it's still a big debate, what are the right measures? And there it seems that it's really, um, yeah, accepted or a high consensus what to do now. So what what do you think, what happens there? Do we have a new experience? What is the, is the deliberation so good or what is the best way to how to, or how to explain that? Austin, what's your theory? Um, uh, it's maybe uh, also a fact that uh, the, in, in the population are, are broad majorities for, for uh, climate protection uh, that you can find uh, in, in the parliament uh, and uh, uh, the citizens assembly shows uh, shows the majorities which which are there by by and uh, which are formulated by people which are not bound by parties and ideolo ideologies uh, but informed by by uh, climate experts um, so they uh, find the right conclusions to that and uh, formulate the, the uh, recommendations uh, they did now in France. It, um, if you look at to, to Ireland, it's uh, not that uh, the citizens' assembly there uh, changed uh, a lot of minds uh, in the Irish population, but uh, um, uh, minds changed before, and uh, the citizens' assembly was only uh, the end of, of this process uh, and uh, formulated recommendations which parties in the parliament were not able uh, to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if I, if I may comment on that, so I take the question now within the uh, citizen assembly, why are there generally the, uh, the measures get a large majority from within the citizen assembly? I think, yeah, it really plays a role that um, you take people, people leave the bubbles they live in, in their everyday life the discussion is not framed in a uh, in this the same controversial manner like you know the, there's someone from that party saying something and from that party but as you enter such a, a room of a uh, randomly chosen people um, I experienced it for the first time in Germany in uh, in Leipzig it it really feels different you know now we are we are just one group of French people, we represent the whole thing. So there is not, not a, um, at the beginning, there's not a feeling that I have to defend myself or something. And then this whole group then is exposed to directly and synchronously all at the same time, they experience at the, uh, the same time what the scientists tell them. And this is also different from sitting alone at your home reading newspaper or reading online or, or something you experience together as this whole group and and so the unity there, there's a sense of unity in front of this uh, information and that is a starting point that I imagine has an influence on all the discussions that come after that and so it's a much better starting point and that is really the whole the secret behind citizen assemblies why they work so much better than actually the traditional parliaments. I would like to add that all um, take this that job very um, seriously and uh, really feel as, as representatives of the whole uh, population uh, and that they have a big responsibility in, in what they're doing there. 
um, uh, one a member of a citizen assembly, I think in Great Britain uh, uh, said uh, that she went in uh, as me and uh, came out as, as we. So uh, it's, um, it's, it's a good uh, picture of, of the process uh, that happens uh, in, in citizens assemblies. That um, uh, it doesn't play a role uh, where you come from, uh, what, what your skin color is and uh, how good you're educated, how much you earn and what your job is um, because all, uh, all are, have, have the same political rights there um, and uh, come from um, uh, all parts of the country and uh, have very different perspectives, which which is a um, yeah an important part of a citizens assembly compared to to parliaments where you mostly have academics uh, and white males, older males, uh, and not the diversity you have in uh, citizens assemblies. With with yeah uh, yeah. Thank you. So this is really a trend you've been observing in um, all of the citizens' conventions you've been following? Yes, I'm, I'm following a, a lot uh, about media, not so directly. Yeah. I try to watch live streams and read interviews with participants. And uh, it goes all in the same directions and all members uh, also in our German uh, citizens' assembly I, I took part in. Uh, as uh, I'm an activist of, of Mehr Demokratie, uh, we, we have the same uh, development. Uh, uh, the participants there um, took, took their job very seriously and um, not a few of them uh, are still engaged in uh, putting the, the um, recommendations to the politicians and the parliament and uh, trying to, to um, put them into law. Mm. Thank you. Um, Daniel, before I get to your question on whether there were um, yeah, yellow vests among the participants. I would like to just follow, um, follow up on what, what you both said about this, um, yeah, the process within the convention. Um, so um, because you mentioned it, if it's by lot, it doesn't matter if you're a male, female, um, or all your other characteristics, how does it work within the discussions of the participants? Um, for example, do you see, or is it monitored, for example, if there is um, a more dominant person in the discussions or is, has that not been a problem at all? Um, yeah, that would be my question. Percy? <laughs> Sorry, um, no, you start. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a mean question, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I know, know yet now it would be good to have uh, some from Mission Public or something, but uh, the general, not so sure how was it in France, in Germany, we have this uh, rule when, when they sit in the small groups that uh, that is one of the tasks of the facilitators to ensure that um, people don't, uh, single people don't dominate the whole process and one is by by the rule when the first person starts and then everybody gets a uh, turn and then the same person gets to talk only once everybody else has had a chance to uh, to speak that is one of the things but then uh, we recently also heard that when people single people try to dominate the whole discussion outside the framed um, discussions like in the breaks they run around with flyers or, or so that they are um the, the general percep perception is no uh, we don't like this and uh um please uh, come down to the equal level and bring in your discussion um your ideas just as everybody else so there's this sense of equality and it seems like the whole group is has this mindset to keep this sense of equality up the whole time I think there's a. I've I've heard several stories that um, that show the kind of immunity uh, that this process and group process uh, has against domin uh, domination by single people, which is, of course, not uh, can't be perfect in the long run, and um, it's, it's one reason why 
for citizen assemblies should not take too long. They should not uh, take several years or whatever, but um, there is a fairly good uh, sense of immunity against domination. I can agree on that. Um, normally you have facilitators uh, which sit at the tables uh, where six to eight people um, can be found and they are mixed and new at every day. So um, that there is, is no party building, but, uh, so special people uh, always stick together and build a fraction. Uh, but uh, but that the participants uh, are um, mixed uh, new newly every day, uh, and so the facilitators look to, uh, for um, that everyone can 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 say his opinion. No one is uh, dominating the discourse, um, so that's uh, one of the qualities of a citizens' assembly. Thank you, and I think Daniela Vancek wanted to add to this. Uh, yeah, I also just wanted to mention something because I helped organize with Ahim Bofa from Midem Kriti a briefing tour to Dublin where we learned really up close about the Irish Citizens Assemblies. It was a three day tour and on the last day we also got to meet with um, some of those actual citizens of the Citizens Assemblies. And um, we also asked this question, how did you really, how was it really controlled that some dominant personalities, that there was equal speaking time? Um, because of course it's just human nature that some um, might be more dominant in their speaking time. And what they said really was, was so key in these conversations was the moderation. That um, already before in the organization of the citizens assemblies that they chose really um, high expert uh, moderators who knew exactly how to split the time to make sure that nobody was dominating the conversations. And so we learned that really moderation is key in this. So um, yeah, I think that's that's probably one of the, the greatest keys and lessons that we learned from the Irish citizen assemblies that I'm sure is, would work for every citizens assembly. Thank you. Um, do you want to comment on this or Thorsten or Percy? Otherwise I will just move on to um, Daniel's question and comments. Go on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Daniel is asking, how were the people chosen? Were there real yellow vests among the participants? I don't know of any yellow vests uh, among the participants. Uh, and um, as uh, what was her name, Nadine, uh, mentioned in, in her interview that uh, the people were randomly chosen by, by phone calls. Um, and in Germany, we uh, invite people by, by a letter. Uh, in other countries, um, they are invited by, by phone um, calls. Um, so one reason might be that uh, some countries don't have a um, database uh, of addresses which they can use to, to invite people by, by letter. Uh, and um, I heard that in, in France, uh, Daniel Combendit of the Greens was also called, but he uh, denied to take part. Um, funny story, if it is true. Um, can I add something? Yeah, of course. So it was by phone because uh, they were trying to have a better representation. So they chose actually people uh, so that there was a good representation of sex. So 51% uh, of women and 49% of men. Also, they made sure that it was the same with age, uh, the level of diploma people had, uh, and also professional categories. So whether people were um, workers or um, CEOs, and also to have a good uh, geographical uh, representation. But as for the political representation or um, for the yellow vest, I don't think they asked anything about that, but they were probably because at some point uh, in France, the movement was so big that they must have reached uh, a few yellow vests, I believe. That was important to add, yes, thank you. I would also like to add something um, because, of course, we don't really know if any of the members of the convention were yellow vests. I mean, they are also just citizens and they could choose if they want to sign with their name or stay anonymous. Um, but 
if you have followed the debates, um, you could really see that this whole um, concern was very prominent um, in all of the discussions. And so this is really something that returned very often. Um, the question that any measure that they would propose would not disproportionately uh, affect um, citizens with lower income or citizens who don't live in the big cities. Um, so this is really something that came back every time. One of the propositions they also made um, was to build new tra li train lines to make traveling by train cheaper. And this is also something that was uh, clearly inspired by the whole um, by the whole yellow vest crisis. Um, so uh, we don't know if the citizens, if some of the citizens were yellow vests, but of course they read the news and they follow the media. And um, this this was just really part of the of the discussion in general. I can say that the Yellow West supported the process of the Citizens' Assembly and was one of the reasons uh, why the Citizens' Assembly took place. Um, there was a grand debat before, also because of the protests of the Yellow West and uh, the Citizens' Assembly Convention Citoyenne was, was the conclusion of that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Carol. <laughs> Sorry, maybe because Thorsten mentioned the Grand Débat. Um, so this was actually a direct, uh, this happened last year, I believe, or, or maybe even two years ago already, um, as is a direct response to the to the Yellow Vest crisis. Uh, the government had organized a Grand Débat National in which they tried to really involve citizens in this sort of uh, really big citizens consultation process. Um, and the problem was that there was no follow up to this, um, to this uh, system at all. So um, citizens were very, very disappointed in it. And the Yellow Vest actually organized their own debate um, in response to it, which was the Vrena, Vre Debat National, the real national debate. Um, and so because of this, uh, because, because this happened, um, the, this, I mean, this was one of the main, I think, motivations also for the government to organize now a real citizens convention with actual binding follow-up, um, so sort of forcing themselves to, um, to, to follow up on this and to do better than they did at the Grand Debat National. Thank you. Um, Daniel, has your question been answered or do you want to talk about your, your comment about the um, yeah, smaller or bigger bias because of um, yeah, voluntary participation in no, no, I, I, I complete. I'm com completely um, convinced. I, I somehow put this question um, uh, in uh, because it's interesting. You know, we have to uh, we, if we if we download this then to YouTube and don't mention all of this. I was a little frightened that we only read uh, talk about the process and not the uh, political reality. And of course, we have uh, to be aware that that uh, those citizen assemblies are not completely covering the people. I think there, there we have to be fair. So in, in, in Ireland, they told us that they, they ch chose the people randomly and then they visited the people at the door. This is a more um, Anglo-Saxon tradition to do that. And about half of the people just slammed the door and said, uh, oh, politics, I'm not interested, go away, and so on. So by definition, it's not random. So they choose the people amongst the non-slammers, the non-door slammers. So then, uh, of course, uh, the question occurs, how, how can we uh, nevertheless uh, have a result at the end? And th that's, of course, uh, the technology of having a referendum. And I think this was a very good process in Ireland. And I, I had a little bit the feeling, also those questions I put in a little bit, um, I knew it already, but um, you know, uh, I had the feeling that amongst the participants of the, of the, um, uh, uh, the French um, assembly, they also were a little frightened to bring the hard question of an environmental somehow um, costly things to the people. And they decided to bring the more symbolic constitutional things to the people. Not, for example, do you want to have um, a higher price for, for diesel or, or so, something like that? 
you know, and uh, so the the the, the um, assembly um, acted a little bit like an, uh, a political body normally does. So this is somehow. So I'm totally convinced. I'm very happy about the process, but we have to uh, stay clear and um, objective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Torsten, you wanted to comment. Uh, one answer to uh, the response rate of citizens' assemblies uh, it depends much on how, how well known uh, this instrument is and uh, how much people trust uh, in its uh, effectiveness. Uh, if you look, for example, to East Belgium and its uh, German-speaking community, which also has a citizens' assembly, the response rate there was uh, about 20% uh, um, at all. Uh, not all uh, said that they want to take part, but 20% uh, said, yes, uh, I want to take part or no, I can't take part. And uh, that's uh, much better than the 5% you normally have, which is um, but uh, also not, not, not a bad number if you know that uh, you um, have to spend several weekends uh, in, in Paris, uh, have to travel a lot have to leave maybe your children alone, have to leave alone uh, relatives which maybe uh, are ill and uh, need your help. Um, you have to leave your work, um, which, which may be important if you're a farmer, for example, you can go for several days and, and leave your farm. There are several reasons uh, why people can take part in citizens' assemblies, but also uh, so, so still support, support it. It's the same in, in Switzerland where you don't have uh, often a, um, a big outcome at, at referenda, but those who don't take part say they trust in those who take part. Um, uh, so it's, it's not a, a bad process at, at all. And, and you always have to have the possibility to take uh, part in it. I would um, take the chance to have a few thoughts about this representative idea. Um, I think it's an, um, it's an, it remains an ideal, of course, um, that, uh, and, and it's an important ideal. And I think one should never forget to, on the one hand, to compare, I mean, how representative is the citizen assembly as opposed to a parliament? And then you can safely say it's much more rep representative. So we are on the safe side. And sometimes it feels a little bit like a perfectionist to talk about a, how we can uh, can we get the last few percent of um, uh, low school education people in or something? Um, so not be perfectionist, and then you can also also ask uh, representative: Is are these groups really important in relation to the topic you're dis discussing? I mean, we're just automatically doing these um, things like uh, gender, age, and whatever. Um, and they can have totally different meanings in different contexts. And we are not, we are not uh, selecting people, for example, according to body size, attractiveness, personality. You could do that. And these are things that are potential, have been shown to be very relevant in other contexts. We never do that. Um, so uh, that's another thing we never find out, or we haven't found out so far, uh, how, how far that played a role, or is that desirable to. <laughs> um, and then, so uh, and and then the other. I, I I think it's good to have a, let's say, a deep diversity with the instruments we have so far. You go deep into the society, and and that's a good thing. And and then on the other hand, the question comes in: Do we have to just respect uh, what people say that they want to participate or not? You can make it easier and and offer and offer and offer. Uh, to them and ask them to uh, to join, but ultimately you have to respect their freedom not to not to join, and there you get the ultimate misrepresentation because people who don't want to participate in a democracy are not ideal Democrats, but they're still there, <laughs> and um, so they they can still miss their chance, and um, and that's their right to do so. Um, Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Caro, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to come back to the to the referendum question um, and what Daniel mentioned, because it is important, of course. Um, a citizens convention, it, it no matter 
how uh, how many criteria we have that we look at um it it they of course 150 people remain representatives of the whole of society and so you could have a skewed sample you don't know that um and and there is no way of knowing if these people agree with what everybody in society thinks um, other than actually putting these questions um, to a vote and so i think um what what could have been different here or what would have um made what, what would have led to different results i think in in france um would have been if um the question of a referendum had been more central to it from the beginning um so so that you sort of would have made the citizens of the convention also think about how do we have to now communicate how we came to the conclusions that we came to, um, to the rest of society. If that would have been part of their task, um, then maybe they would have been also willing to put more questions or more of their proposals to a vote um, in the society um, as a whole. Um, and I think that would have um, and they wouldn't have been so afraid to, um, to, to leave it just to some sort of symbolical questions, um, as we said before, and leave sort of the financial things um, to decide. Um, so, so sort of like make education part of the, of the task of the convention would have been good. Thank you. I think, uh, I yeah, one Percy point, and sorry, can I, can yeah. I, one, one sure. thing I just forgot. I think one. <laughs> When we compare France to uh, UK, the, the one thing we should always keep in mind, U UK did a, one very good thing that is relevant to the representativeness, that you ask people whether they care about the question of well, this is an assembly, and that's what they did in UK. They ask uh, is uh, something like, is, is, do you care much about uh, protecting the climate or something? And then they matched that distribution to what they knew from uh, polls, from representative polls. And that is something I think maybe you can discuss whether that should be the standard. So you get not, in, so in France, you certainly had a bias towards people who cared about the climate subject, even, even though you got many who didn't, but you had a, certainly a bias. And there, there's this way to avoid that, the, that they used in, in the UK. Yeah, thank you. Torsten, you also wanted to comment? Yeah, uh, in France, I was also, also a climate skeptic, uh, but he changed his mind as he learned from the experts about climate change and that it's uh, really uh, man-made and not a uh, uh, follow-up of, of the sun um, and what, what the sun is, is doing more or less uh, in its uh, history. Um, Daniel um, mentioned, uh, I, I just forgot again, the topic of, of the referenda and uh, that the uh, members of the citizens assembly uh, rejected a lot of topics uh, to put them to, to a referendum and uh, my impression was that they weren't well informed uh, about uh, direct democracy and its processes they uh, debated a lot of cl about climate change and solutions but never spent time on uh, debating good processes of direct democracy and how their, their recommendations could be put uh, to, to, to referendums in France. And so they feared uh, that uh, their recommendations would, would be uh, rejected and uh, trusted in President Macron's, uh, um, President Macron saying that uh, he will, will um, overtake the recommendations uh, so filled with, with, without a filter to the parliament and, and put them uh, to a referendum himself. Um, I think that was, was one of the problems and the, the other one that the uh, assembly um, uh, worked too long. That's uh, one, one problem too, that they were too professionalized, uh, learned too much and uh, were something in between uh, normal citizens and uh, parliamentarians. Uh, and uh, lost the connections uh, to the population and the trust in, in, in their own uh, citizens. Thank you. Um, before we get to the next question in the chat, I um, just wanted to ask, was there anything else in the French convention that you would change if you were to repeat it? Um, now that, we're, that we kind of started the topic, um, is there anything I mean, all, all three of you would add. Okay, then let's continue. It, it, it shouldn't take that long, as I said, just said, yeah. 
Yeah. But that, that was was not planned. It was due to, to strikes and Corona that it took that long. Um, what was meant to uh, be finished in, in January, I think, um, and uh, that didn't work for several reasons. The website should be translated to English. From yes. <laughs> Um, so that international audience can follow, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that question by Max. Yeah, um, one sec. Max, do you want to read out your question or should I? Um, yes, I can read it out as uh, if in case you, you can hear me. Yes, all right. Um, so um, I think there was one topic that uh, is missing in the um, proposals made by the French Climate Assembly, uh, from my point of view, because um, I, in the past, I um, also read the report of, on the UK Climate Assembly. And um, yes, the issue with um, how to generate uh, energy or electricity in the future um, I, I thought maybe it's due to the, the reliance on um, nuclear energy in France that maybe the um, the um, assembly members didn't consider it as important. Um, but um, yeah, how big of a, of a topic is it in other countries other than the UK? Um, that that's my question. Yeah, I think Torsten, you were the first to raise your hand. Go yeah, the climate assemblies are normally about the reduction of carbon dioxide and uh, formally uh, nuclear power stations don't emit carbon dioxide. So this uh, can be formal, can formally not, not be a topic and you sh mm. should maybe have an, an, an citizens assembly on, uh, on energy, uh, introducing also uh, nuclear uh, energy, alternative energies. Uh, I think that was the main reason that uh, it would both uh, citizen assemblies did not deal with, with this topic. Well, I was told that um, it was argued from the beginning that this is just about reduction from uh, CO2 emissions from how we cons how French people consume energy in the time frame of 10 years. But the, where energy comes from in France in the long run uh, was said first it's uh, energy production and uh, uh, and for now the production is okay CO2-wise. Uh, it will be changed somehow, but it will change over a longer time period, not within those 10 years. So it was both uh, off topic and off time frame, so to say. Um, and here just the little ups map showing that uh, France being green as opposed to this slightly brown Germany is has has very low CO2 production in comparison with their electricity uh, production. They currently don't have um, much on that level. Um, and that would be, yeah, but it's uh, really important to keep that in mind because in almost every other country, for example, Germany, the, the central topic would be completely different. If you had a climate assemb assembly in Germany, it would be definitely about energy pro uh, production or should be. Um, and, and, and that will maybe make it uh, limit comparability. You, you cannot just transfer the, um, the model from France to other countries because it has a different starting point. Yes, thank you. Um, any more comments on this question? Um, I know you just said, Percy, that we cannot just do um, policy transfers or convention transfers between countries. But um, I wanted to ask maybe to wrap up our session because we only have um, 15 minutes uh, left. We could think a bit about what a good convention should have. Like what is the, the minimum threshold for a good convention if we were to organize it somewhere else? And I know that both of you have <laughs> organized it somewhere else and have done a lot of um, yeah, studying about this. So um, yeah, maybe we could talk a bit about this and also Andreas raised his hand. Yes, I, I think that's a good idea and a good, a good proposal from you, Anne. I also want to uh, want just to add, so if you, so what looks a 
the best practice or the be ideal convention, how can it look like? And if you have ideas, because we are here at the global or online forum on modern direct democracy as well, um, how to combine it uh, with direct democracy tools. I mean, I, especially to also to you, Torsten, you have so watch or monitored so many different uh, citizen assemblies all over the world. Are there good practices? I mean, we heard a little bit about the island um, example. We heard a little bit about the referendums in French, uh, France, which will take place now. But yeah, if you have other ideas, how to combine uh, citizen assemblies, assemblies with um, direct democracy, uh, citizen initiatives or referendums, that would be great as well. Yeah, um, I would say that uh, the, the deliberative quality of uh, the most processes is, is very good. They are all more or less evaluated and uh, all evaluations say that uh, the deliberation done in, in the citizens' assemblies is a very good process. But what's important is uh, who decides on, on, on the topics which uh, are put on, on the agenda and who uh, invites the experts, the experts which uh, give their input to the participants is also an um, important question uh, which we, we are often asked because there is a, is a possibility to manipulate uh, citizens assemblies if you invite experts only uh, from, from one side of, of a topic. Uh, or if you ask the wrong question, um, which uh, can be said maybe about a British uh, Citizens Assembly, which, which had a um, question uh, to, to um, get Great Britain climate neutral uh, to up to, to, to 2050, where experts say it's necessary to reach uh, climate neutrality uh, in 2030. So uh, from the beginning on, maybe the question was wrong. And uh, so I prefer uh, the process uh, of, of the Citizens Assembly in East Belgium, I just mentioned, where um, normal citizens also have the possibility to um, ask for a topic to, to collect uh, signatures. And if you collect 100 signatures, you can ask uh, um, a Bürgerrat um, to, to put uh, this topic uh, on the agenda of the um, so-called Bürgerversammlung. They have... Uh, two uh, parts of, of a citizens assembly there and uh, randomly selected people um, decide on, on the agenda uh, about what, what they're talking. No politicians, uh, no one else, but only the, the people uh, decide what they talk about. And it's the same in Vorarlberg where you uh, have the possibility to collect thousands of signatures uh, and um, then there must uh, take place a citizens assembly on the topic you collected the uh, signatures for so that you have um, a, a kind of a direct democracy also in this process. And it's also good if you have maybe a referendum um, uh, which uh, will take place, for example, in uh, the French region Occitanie. They have a citizens assembly on a Green New Deal at the moment. Uh, and in November, all citizens uh, of this region will be able to have a say on the recommendations of this citizens assembly. Thank you. Percy, did you want to? Are we talking uh, about climate assemblies or assemblies in general? I mean, if you have recommendations for both, um, or yeah, both separately, um, that would be great. And yeah, otherwise, just conventions in general and how to. Yeah, connect there, them to there's so many. Groups. There's so many aspects you can go very deep. I I now go. And I'll go more to the outside. I think it's very important that the whole process has enough publicity and that it's really rooted in, you know, just pe that, that people know about it. And this can be potentially a problem when the, you know, a first citizen assembly, you kind of just barely get your government or parliament to do one and they, okay, they do it, but they do not care about the publicity. And so, it's good to, to have that. Um, so in Germany, I think we are very lucky that we have this uh, strong more democracy uh, organization who is, is taking on that role, um, making the citizen assembly known. And you can do that, of course, uh, first thing through uh, the media, but then also networking and involving more uh, NGOs into the whole thing, make them supporters of the process. So there's all kinds of 
uh, strategies uh, to do that and would be really, I think that that is one important measure. I was just thinking about that when you reported the uh, results from France, like who knew about the whole process and who um, supported it would be actually very interesting to do, uh, to have a before and after thing, for example. Um, and so the knowledge in the population hopefully then grows over time and, 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 uh, and we hope that they share this because what you, what you want, actually you want to know in advance whether they think this will be legitimate, irrespective of the, of the outcome. Because I've had some people, you know, too much said, yeah, in France they had these 149 suggestions and in the, among those suggestions was this and this and that, and then that person went, what? That sounds horrible. <laughs> I don't like those results. So then, of course, you get um, results uh, and, and, and the principal process legitimacy are being confounded then. And it would be interesting to have those uh, two things separated in, in the future, maybe. We can do that in Germany. Yeah, so um, have a deep uh, founding in, in the civic society, at least, by all means. Mm -hmm. Any more ideas? Maybe about political support a bit more. Um, we've talked about this in, in other webinars. Um, how important is, is political support? And then I would like to get back to the chat because we've had some comments. Yeah, I mean, we've heard that uh, when we were in Ireland already, right? And uh, um, there, there of the opinion should be the government who supports the whole thing. In UK was the parliament. We'll see what the result is, but um, yeah, it was kind of ideal in, in France too. That's the other thing we haven't talked about that really he, Macron make, made a big announcement and in the beginning he was showing up at, during the process and then in, in the end he had also a ceremony uh, handing over the report and stuff. Uh, so that, that is really ideal. There were so many critical people who said, ah, Macron is not, it's just a lie and stuff, but so far there's no real evidence for that, but we'll see. Um, besides, if anybody knows more about the current status of the uh, politics in France, I, I think that would be important to follow up, but uh, support there was really good, um, as it was in Ireland. Um, I think those are the two leading examples, right? Thorsten, do you think? Yeah. Yes, surely important that the government and parliament are behind the citizens' assembly because they are those who have to decide on the recommendations. And if it's not clear if the recommendations are taken seriously, as for example in Great Britain, we don't know how Boris Johnson and his government will deal with that, even if you have the support of parts of the parliament. Uh, this uh, can't be a, a good process. It's uh, maybe on the other side not good to have to uh, rely on, on government and parliament uh, and not a, have the possibility to, to have a referendum if the government doesn't follow. But uh, that's a problem in many countries um, at the moment where you don't have uh, Swiss direct democracy you can always use in, in case of uh, not following uh, the things that people want. Thank you. Yeah. Caro, you wanted to add something? Um, it, yeah, it's in relation to this question, but also to what's, uh, what's in the chat, actually. So I can um, wait. I don't know if this person wants to. Yeah. Um, Christoph, you've posted some, um, some comments in the chat. Do you want to um, maybe read them out or um, yeah, say them out loud, and then we can discuss about it? You're on mute, Christoph. Okay. 
Christoph, unfortunately, we can't hear you. You're mute. Here? Uh, here? Yes, yes. Yeah, sorry nice. about that. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I just have to, yeah. No, I, I, I wanted to say that the, the, uh, the hardest thing is the combination between participatory democracy and direct democracy, because I think that's the case in France. Uh, the, I got very interesting comments uh, about Oregon, but uh, in France, we know that uh, there is no, uh, so the process was not calibrated in that way. It's just that, yes, uh, it's just a way of uh, justifying future political measures. And in fact, I, I, I'm, I think it is going to be a form of greenwashing politics in that, in that sense. But, but my question overall is more about how can we promote uh, direct democratic instruments without uh, uh, without selecting the best instruments because I think that in most other countries participatory instruments uh, challenge direct democratic instruments because most of the representatives prefer these options than just having uh, direct democratic tools so my suggestion was maybe if we have to campaign for for uh, direct democracy, democracy tools, it might be better to, uh, to uh, present the whole kit with uh, citizen assemblies, with a request, with possible possibilities to, uh, to, uh, to be associated with the questions and so on, because otherwise we don't control the time process. And at the end, we have, yes, this uh, participatory democracy uh, blowing everywhere, but uh, without any consequences on the political decisions. So that was more comment on the uh, the difficulty to combine both uh, aspects. Mm -hmm. I hope that you, you. you could hear me. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. The sound was perfect <laughs> once it started. Um, I think, Caro, you wanted to comment? And I also saw that Torsten, you uh, posted something in the chat. So, yeah, if... Uh, you want to follow after Carol and go ahead. Yeah, um, no, I think that I think that's very important. And I think you see uh, big differences between countries. Um, and I think it's a challenge also for us as people who work uh, on topics of direct democracy um, to not see it as sort of a competition. Um, I think what Torsten said is absolutely right. Um, if it's done right, um, then citizens assemblies, and I think Percy also mentioned this, they really improve the quality of dialogue um, in, in society as a whole. And so they can lead to better direct democratic decisions. Um, but of course, it, what, what's missing in France is a legal framework for direct democracy. Um, and so this is, uh, this is the real problem uh, of the follow-up on the citizens' assembly. Yes, Macron has promised um, that, he, that, he will follow, um, that he will follow them sans filtre, as he says, without a filter, the recommendations of the citizens' convention. But we have nothing to hold him to it. We just have to believe that he will do it. We have his word to go on. Um, and for, for example, um, we saw that he already put a little asterisk next to that. He has uh, three vetoes. Uh, that he uh, that he can use and and uh, for one that uh, Torsten listed them before, but I was just looking it up. Um, one that he didn't mention is the Citizens Convention also uh, proposed to renegotiate CETA, the CETA agreement, um, to follow the Paris uh, to be in line with the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, and so this is also one that uh, that uh, President Macron would prefer not to uh, discuss. Yes, um, of course. Just as a for for obvious reasons, uh, so just as a little um, as a little follow up, um, and so but just to come back to this, like how um, participation tools can can really inform and improve and breed life into, into direct dem democracy tools. I think Ireland, uh, we've talked about it a lot, is a really great example um, because they have they had a, a, um, two or three citizens assemblies now. I think. Um, on topics that are in the constitution. And so there's a great legal framework for it because in Ireland, if you want to change the constitution, you have to have a referendum. And so this means that from the get-go, it is clear to all of the members of the, of, the, of the citizens convention that they will have to have this broader discussion in the whole of society and that this will go into a bigger debate that everybody will eventually vote on. And so this, um, of course, leads to a whole new quality of um, of bindingness and, and dialogue. And uh, this is actually a really nice uh, tool, I think. Thank you. Torsten, do you want to add something? 
Yeah, I would also say that there should be no competition with, between uh, representative direct uh, democracy and deliberative democracy because all work uh, best together. Um, direct democracy can improve uh, representative democracy. Deliberative uh, democracy can help both uh, representative and direct democracy and uh, all uh, work together. Um, best together and um, not uh, only representative democracy, it's not enough to only uh, have a vote uh, every five years and uh, it's um, not enough only to, to have a deliberation but uh, no referendum on, on important topics. Thank you. Percy, I couldn't see if you raised your hand, um, if you wanted to comment, no? Okay, then one very last question before we close this session uh, from Petra. Um, if there are any experiences with adaptations in organizations or other institutions like schools, if you have any examples for us. Not regarding deliberative democracy. I know about uh, democracy, democracy projects in schools in Germany, for example, Projekt Aula. Uh, of Marina Weisband uh, and Politik uh, Digital, I think, but uh, not the use of uh, uh, aspects of citizens' assemblies in schools. Daniela, if you wanted to say something? Um, yeah, actually, in, I have an example of that in Michigan. Um, we voted by Citizens uh, Initiative um, to end the process of gerrymandering, uh, which is the drawing of the districts, um, the voting districts in, in the US, it's been a big problem for decades now. And we've um, changed this process where before it was politicians that were choosing these districts. Um, in Michigan now, this will be done by a group of citizens chosen by lot. So it will be, I think, a committee of nine citizens or so. They will be um, three self-identified Democrats, three self-identified Republican, and then independents. So it's also used uh, now to draw the districts in Michigan. Thank you. And Carol, you also had an example, I believe. Just a very small addition. There's a lot of schools that do participatory budgeting. It is not exactly the same, but uh, it, it's definitely um, letting pupils participate in decision making at the school level. It's where um, so uh, a number of students, um, they could be drawn by a lot, but they could also just be voted on or, or um, volunteer, um, get to decide on um, on a part of the budget for the school, and then they get to um, do projects with that, so it's, which is something that exists in a lot of places. Okay, and that's perfect timing. Our Percy. Oh, sorry, Percy. Yeah, please go ahead. I was going to say, uh, I think uh, schools are probably too small units uh, uh, to make uh, sense a case for this uh, random selection. Random selection is representative particip participation in this case. And I think there's a that is actually the major di uh, dividing line between representative uh, citizen participation and what I would call stakeholder participation, where you just go and invite people uh, Sometimes you even get to talk to all people uh, who are stakeholders. And uh, so this would be the case for many uh, small units, um, but that's not where we need sortition. Thank you. Um, really a gigantic thank you to the three of you for joining us today. It was really, really interesting. And um, yeah. <laughs> we will continue our next session at half past six from right so we have a short break now and i hope to see you all again at 6 30. it was fun thank yeah, you thank, thank you, you. <laughs> bye bye see you saturday latest yes bye